so yes, we have uh, our next um, speaker is our keynote speaker. His name is Peter Musaferiadis. Uh, as I said earlier, Peter Musaferiadis um, has had an extensive career as a creative director, a producer, an artistic director, a music director, a composer, and he's a champion of intercultural dialogues. And it's even more in the context of what is going on today. And so that's from my part. Uh, in 2003, Peter founded Cultural Infusion. So it's a global social enterprise that works with schools, youth, digital media, and the arts to promote cultural harmony for a more cohesive and richer society. Cultural Infusion delivers programs in India, Brazil, South Africa, Egypt, Cambodia, and throughout Australia. Uh, please uh, welcome to Peter, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, are you able to uh, switch the camera on? Thank you. Uh, give me video access. Henry? Yeah, my video has been stopped. Thank you. I think that's... So, Henry? Hello. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. We can, yes. But we cannot see you. We can't see you Yes, yet. it says here my video has been stopped by the host. So, someone needs to provide me some access. Henry, are you are you there? Can you hear us? Let me call uh, Henry very quickly. Peter, sorry, just give us a quick second. No, take your there. time. I still, have, I still think we have a few minutes. If we want, we can probably give everyone some uh, a few minutes break and then come back. I'm happy yeah. with that too. Well, well, we'll see how it goes. Um, I just want to also well, to Sonia and uh, Douglas welcome as well. Uh, and um, I, yeah. Uh, Peter, s'il te plaît pour sa vidéo. À Peter, cultural infusion. That's me. Yes. Some of the technical uh, challenges That's when we um, and really welcome to Rudy as well. So some technical challenges when we uh, doing a, something new. We will get there. Merci. Euh, bah, il, a, il a toujours pas la vidéo. Ok, here I am, everyone. Thank you. C'est bon. Merci, Henri. Super. À tout à l'heure. Ok. Well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Peter Musaferiadis, uh, and uh, I'm at, here. It's uh, eight o'clock, um, and I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and I'm very honoured and uh, humbled to be in the presence of every single one of you and everyone who's listening listening out there in uh, the World Wide Web. Uh, this, for me, um, you know. How could I explain it? I suppose it's a very, very... <clears throat> Can you all still see me? Because I've just changed screens, just to look yes. at some notes. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, so for me, uh, it's, it's a very significant time. Why? Because, you know, yesterday I marked the 75th uh, uh, anniversary of the end of World War II. And of course, today is also uh, Europe Day. Um, which uh, you know is a day to uh, you know celebrate uh, peace and unity. And on that note, I'd like to uh, offer just a few moments silence for all of us to offer a few moments silence for all those who aren't in the position that we're in, 
for those who are in a less uh, fortunate position and those who are experiencing dislocation and those who are being affected by this uh, virus. So just a few moments silence, thanks. Okay, so thank you very much for observing that, those moments of silence. Um, I initially commenced my studies as a, um, someone who had an interest in Corne Greek, which was the language uh, that came about as a result of Alexander's expansion into South Asia. And I was interested in becoming a, a theologian, but uh, music got the better of me. So Israel, listening to you today has been very moving because uh, I uh, share uh, a lot of interests in common with you. I went off and studied Western classical music and then went to um, Europe and spent four years studying uh, in Italy, uh, what was then called Czechoslovakia before it split into uh, the Czech Republic and the Slovakian Republic uh, and did a short stint in the US for six months. So all up about a bit over four years. <clears throat> During this period, I always felt my own heritage was being denied. I was always curious about the music of other cultures and why they weren't given an equal voice, a voice similar or standing similar to that of Western classical music. <clears throat> because there were classical music traditions out there that predated Western classical music by hundreds of years, in some cases, thousands of years, if you went to ancient Chinese classical music or Byzantine classical music. There were traditions out there which weren't being given an equal voice. I suppose in one way that Bravo, was from Bravo. Tell an emasfali, Trem. Tell an emasfali. Which can either me do tell you, I say. Thank you. Dimitri, thanks. Dimitri, 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 I wanted to start an organization that would not only conserve those intangible traditions, but find ways to revitalize those tra uh, traditions. And that's how I suppose I gave birth to the organization I founded, uh, which was actually in 2002, um, Cultural Infusion. And the idea was, how could we find ways to discover the other, to give an equal voice to the other, because through doing that, what would happen is we'd begin to reinforce the self and discover ourself. And this is what I found with uh, forming this organization, Cultural Infusion. But more importantly, I also began to realize that cultural infusion was a way of being able to create that lived experience. And this was very important as a way of being able to counter uh, ethnic and race-based discrimination because the drivers of ethnic and race-based discrimination um, <clears throat> are, are mainly fear and ignorance. And the way to counter fear and ignorance is through collaboration and familiarization. So that's why education is important. That's why the arts is very important, which is one of the pillars of the Change Makers Lab, because in the arts you can create a safe haven to explore all sorts of issues. You know, we know the power of music, the power of seeing, you know, the, the artistic project with the birds that you highlighted at the beginning of today, Vasily, are all quite, um, uh, quite moving. Anyway, I wanted to share my screen now. So I'm just gonna share my screen and show uh, some, of the, uh, some of the work that I, been involved in over the years. And then I'm gonna to begin to talk about the, the structure that I set up, which is basically a fusion of profit and non-profit coming together. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, can you all? okay then, so yes. yeah, good. Thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, start the slideshow from, uh, this current slide. I, I might start first of all by uh, just telling you a little bit about my uh, heritage. Both my, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
my, my grandparents on my father's side came from Asia Minor uh, in uh, 1923 after the Asia Minor catastrophe. And my grandfather, who used to love uh, visiting people, had a different name at the time, uh, but was given the name Musafiri, which means the visitor or the traveller. And that's because he used to love travelling and visiting. And that's the story behind my name. And every name has a story behind it. What's interesting is I find myself, or well, up until COVID, I was spending between four and five months of the year traveling. Uh, these are just some images of, uh, I'm going to quickly go through some of these images of some of the programs that we've been running into schools. So through our organization, Cultural Infusion, um, the Discovering Diversity program is delivered now to more than 350,000 students across Australia. And it's the most expansive program of its type in the world. And it's the most successful. And children love it. Children who have never, uh, um, ever had, ex have experienced an Aboriginal person or someone from Zimbabwe or someone from China or a Mongolian singer really begin to uh, be in close contact and experience that person and begin to discover that they have a lot in common. Um, one of the jobs that I started to do after my career as a conductor was I was invited to direct opening and closing ceremonies. <clears throat> and I found myself uh, working on a lot of big events with the Dalai Lama, with indigenous people. And I began to realize that we don't all see the world through the same way, but we can find values and we can find themes that we can begin to celebrate together and share stories. And here is a story, a creative dance piece that uh, I produced uh, for the UN uh, Welcome Ceremony uh, 10 years ago. And it told the story that, um, you know, once upon a time, uh, the earth was, uh, uh, all the continents were connected and to remind us that all human beings are connected in some way or another. And we told that through this creative piece. Uh, here's some, some other images of some stories. Uh, occasionally, I would take the liberty to conduct. I would put lots of different orchestras together and ensembles together. And quite often, we found ourselves working with refugees. But just I want you to think of today versus maybe 30 years ago and how today the importance of having uh, skills that allow you to relate to the other are more important than ever. Why? Because the world's becoming increasingly globalized. To think Prior to 1989, we had no World Wide Web. So all of a sudden, we've gone from having the World Wide Web to being exposed to information and cultures from all over the world. So the ability to be able to have those and uh, navigate your way through how other people see the world has become more important than ever. So for us, artistic productions were a way of being able to celebrate that, to discover that, and to send people on a journey so they could begin to go on their own discovery so they could discover the other. Because through discovering the other, like I said earlier on, you begin to discover yourself. You know, one year for our Australia Day concerts, I produced nine Australia Day concerts for our government here. And they cast of anywhere from 150 up to sometimes 1,500 people. And we, here we told the story of bovine creatures, cows and bulls. And how in some parts of the cold, some parts of the world are considered sacred animals. In other parts of the world, we told myths associated with them. We told the story of the Minotaur and how the Minotaur came about. We told the stories of how in the South, in South Asia, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, cows are considered sacred animals. And in the West, sometimes they're considered just mere walking hamburgers. Here are just some other images of some of the other productions we've produced. <clears throat> And lastly, here's a, uh, a production, my last Australia Day concert that I produced in 2012. And we told the stories of um, what's in your suitcase. And we were able to celebrate uh, diversity uh, through many different cultures coming together and telling their stories about a suitcase, or maybe they didn't have a suitcase. But I'll, this is just a, a diagram, uh, which explains earlier on uh, the importance of intercultural dialogue in transforming um, um, racism into empathy. And it just reiterates earlier what I said, uh, which is the drivers of racism are ignorance and fear, and the counter drivers are familiarization and collaboration. And the importance uh, for uh, education, exchange, dialogue, which is what all of you are already doing in an incredible way. Uh, just moving on, I'm now going to talk about 
uh, the traditional sectors that we're all familiar with. The first sector is uh, the not-for-profit sector. And basically, not-for-profit um, basically means that if there is a profit at the very end, it can't be distributed to the shareholders unless there's an agreement. But generally speaking, not-for-profit entities are very mission-driven. You know, they're socially driven. You have the government sector or the public sector, as it's referred to in some sector, in some parts of the world. And the last sector here is the private sector, the profit sector. Now, when I formed uh, Cultural Infusion, way before that, I was doing a lot of thinking about what type of structure I wanted to form. Uh, because a lot of people were saying to me, well, you need, maybe you need to be a not-for-profit or maybe you need to be a profit. But what I found through the profit structure was even though I was considered a social enterprise, which was, well, we can't really stovepipe by definition what we mean by uh, social enterprises, but I think with what we can say is that they have a common objective to build human capacity, to build social capacity. So, uh, you know, in Australia, they're recognised and in some cases they can access some levels of funding but generally speaking you can't access levels of funding so where i wanted to engage in professional development where i wanted with my organization to access regional and remote communities it was impossible to do uh, because uh, it wasn't viable to run those within a profit framework so what i needed to do was set up a not-for-profit uh, entity uh, which would allow me to access public funds and then have the overarching mission of the organization that both the profit and the not-for-profit structures could feed into. Uh, and this took a lot of work and it required, a, you know, it was an arduous task of being able to understand these different sectors and, and also the different accountability connected with those sectors. But today across the world, there is no real fourth sector. The fourth sector is sort of a combination of both those. And this is something that I've been trying to advocate for uh, over the last uh, 15 years. Um, so here we have just a, a diagram again, the, you know, there's three different sectors, the public sector, the social sector, but the, and the private sector. But the private sector is also the social sector today. We're seeing that more and more. And a lot of the social sector organisations also behave in a profit way because they're aiming to make profits, which they keep in the comp in their organisations to then distribute. But wouldn't it be great if we were able to form a different type of organisation that could be recognised by government, that could allow, that could be a fusion of the profit and the not for profit. And I might come to that a little bit later. So um, I coined the phrase actually back in 1998, uh, more than uh, 22 years ago, a hybrid social enterprise and people thought I was crazy. What was, what are you talking about? I mean, there's no such thing. I said, well, it's just a theoretical concept that I have that we probably, that I operate in this middle space over here, or that's where we all need to be operating, or here, in this case here, a, co a combination of a profit and a, uh, the, the private sector and the not-for-profit. But wouldn't it be great if this entity here could be recognised by governments across the world? Uh, and that's been a sort of a sideline project of mine. Uh, I'd like to sort of, you know, reinvigorate it. And now that I've met you, Vasily, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be part um, of this forum today, Vasily. I think it's um, uh, wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, something we could probably take uh, to, you know, um, intergovernmental organisations across the world to start to think about what this new entity would uh, look like. But you know, I'm, I'm just I'm showing you this other graph here because I'm gonna I'm gonna move my uh, conversation somewhere else, and I know I only have a few minutes left. But um, there's the you know the, we talk about the social uh, you know whenever governments do planning, they think of social planning, environmental planning, and economic planning. So uh, we have got the public sector, the social private sector, which I've already talked about. I'm just going to move on very really quickly. Um, Sorry, I've got, I've got a whole lot of other graphs. I might just go through these really, really quickly so you can just get a feel. We've got the social, economic and environmental, but our organisation really works in this area of culture. And I believe culture is overarching, it's underpinning. It really is what defines humanity. You know, and according to UNESCO, you know, culture is a driver for sustainability, for 
key to quality education. Uh, culture can also be um, a driver for innovation. Culture can be a driver for reducing poverty. It can, it's a mighty force. That's what culture is. So why aren't we focusing our societies on uh, culture? Why aren't we doing more uh, to, uh, to create a pillar based on culture? Why do I say that? Because I genuinely believe that if you really want to have social impact, we need to have cultural impact first. You know, every society has a culture, you know, a way of thinking, a way of behaving. You know? And if you really want to create change, well, you know, social change is embedded within, or, uh, or uh, within culture at the end of the day, within the culture of a society. So because we have this overarching culture and this is where I think we need to work towards. But you know, I, I wanna move now, if we were to type the word culture into Google, you'd quickly find, uh, or intercultural understanding, you'll find that intercultural understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, and what we mean by intercultural understanding is a two way process where we all take something away from engaging in dialogue with the view of creating something uh, new. But when I started to you know, Google culture, uh, uh, I began to find these other terms and I found that cultural conflict had 244 million results. This is back in 2014, I think. So the statistics have changed quite a bit. According to the United Nations and UNESCO, 75% of all the conflict that we have in the world has a cultural dimension. So why are we doing more? Why aren't we investing more in culture? According to the Global Peace Index, they believe that um, something like 13% of the world's GDP is spent on dealing with conflict. Uh, with dealing with, uh, so if you were to look at that uh, in terms of numbers, it's something like about you know, 13, 14 trillion dollars is spent of the global GDP dealing with the cost of violence and conflict every year. According to the UN, 75% of that has a cultural dimension. So why aren't we developing a pillar around um, culture? And so I've said culture is a mighty force. I've talked about culture as an enabler and driver for sustainable development, you know, an eradicator of poverty, key to quality education, a key to social cohesion and, inclu and inclusion, a driver of innovation. Why aren't we looking as a culture as sitting at the center of everything? Why aren't we looking at culture as being almost everything? Because if we can do that, then we may be able to create the societies we want to create. So what I started to do a few years ago, I started to coin the phrase cultural enterprise rather than social enterprise. The difference being in this case for our organization is how do we use market forces to motivate behavioral change? I, look, I still have a few more slides and I know I've run out of time, but I'm just gonna probably end on this uh, slogan, which I developed uh, for the UN, uh, for the UN campaign a few years ago, called Diver Diversified We Grow. And I'm just gonna play it from the beginning. Every person, every culture is a sum of human experience. Our history has shown that progress is possible through interaction and cooperation. Working together in an interconnected and intercultural age is the next frontier of our new and exciting world. Multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-faceted, multi-talented, multicultural. We must acknowledge the value of each unique culture by engaging, exciting, and enticing the next generation through intercultural understanding in communities, in the arts, in the media, in business, and in education. Greatness was not achieved by any one culture. Greatness was born of the human experience. Divided we fall, united we stand, diversified we grow. Okay, and that brings my presentation to the end.
Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for that incredible, incredible presentation. Like every time you were talking, I was like, that is awesome. I want to talk about that. So, but I think I'll, I'll say that um, culture in terms of values and themes for shared story to be able to see the world differently. And uh, I think uh, in context of asking you to join us, this is exactly the reason that, um, you know, uh, from a, as a social entrepreneur, as you called it, a hybrid social enterprise. I think the speakers that are going to be following now is all people that are driven purpose, uh, purpose driven, and, um, uh, you know, have got the cultural aspect to it as well and want to have impact in society. So it's definitely the sweet spot in the presentation that you made with those different circles. I think the speakers in this panel, this is what it's about. It's about the social economy. And uh, uh, I mean, people may not see it as a social economy, but it's about impact, social impact, let's call them entrepreneurs. But I love the pillar of culture and the importance of that. It's absolutely phenomenal. And the last point is even, it was Israel or Jalal saying, we need a, cult, we need a center to bring people together. And this is where we can, learn from one another culture and as we've seen Israel with all the amazing Greek music. So thank you very much. This was an amazing presentation and we look forward to continued discussions later on. Thank you very much for Silly. And once again, it's, a, uh, it's, uh, it's an honor and it's humbling to be uh, part of uh, the discussion uh, today uh, on this very, very important day, a day that stands for peace uh, and unity. Thank you. It's an honor to have you. Thank you very much, Peter. So, Arthur. Excuse me, Peter. Before we before we end up, we have a question from Daphne, uh, who is asking, "Where are you from cultural infusion?" And I'm not sure what that means. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe yes, she's uh, okay. I I am the uh, the CEO and the founder of Cultural Infusion. Uh, were there any other particular questions or anything specific in mind that she had? Uh, we're based in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and we run programs across Australia. And now, now we're only running program, programs in Tanzania and in Pakistan. So once we've developed the programs, we usually move into different areas. And that's our living culture program as a way of being able to um, uh, use culture as a way of creating sustainable pathways uh, for uh, people, especially youth in developing communities, and as a way of them being able to be connected with their own heritage and developing a sense of pride uh, in who they are. Oh. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you, Daphne, for this question. Peter, it will be great if we can have uh, on you after for the, if you can also join us uh, as part of the panel and if questions do come through. So please, if you can stay, it would be great. I know it's getting late there, but yeah. I'm cool. here to stay here. I'm going to stay as long as I can. I might just come and go after the panel, uh, but yeah, it's completely fine. I'm enjoying this and I'm enjoying uh, uh, listening to all the views that have been presented. Awesome.